Awesome. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to get to virtually meet you all, uh, sort of as much as any of us get to do that these days. Um, and really excited to talk about this work. Um, the session is called Creating and Curating LGBTQ Inclusive Open Materials. <laughs> It's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, my name is Sabia Prescott. I'm a policy analyst uh, based in Washington, DC, but located in Pennsylvania in the US. Um, and this is really the bulk of, of the work that I get to do that I really have a personal and professional investment in. So um, like I said, I'm really great, grateful to have you all here today and to talk a little bit about it. I'm gonna figure out how to advance these, there we go. Um, so it's a little bit of an overview um, for how we'll, we'll spend our time together today. Um, first, I'll do introductions, tell you a little bit more about who I am and, and what this work is and what it looks like um, for me and for our, our communities who work on it. Um, and then I'd love to hear from you all as well, just to know a little bit about who's here and, and what brings you to this session and to this work. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what LGBTQ inclusion is, right? What it looks like, um, what it, how I define it in my own work. Um, but also, again, I'd love to know um, how that sort of maps onto your own understandings and your own experience. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then what does it have to do with open education, right? The, the bridge between LGBTQ inclusion um, in the classroom and in learning environments and then open education are not, it's not always sort of a, an obvious connection to a lot of people, but I think it actually does make a lot of sense. So I'll, I'll sort of make that case. Um, and then, and then again, we can see, uh, you know, how, how that feels with folks and if that sort of maps onto your own experiences. I'll share a little bit with you about the framework that I use when I'm looking at materials, specifically open materials um, that you can adapt and, and um, edit and then share back out and sort of what questions I ask of the content and of the creators when I'm thinking about how to make things more inclusive. So we'll really uh, get into those exact questions. Um, and then finally, we'll workshop a little bit with, with actual examples from actual open texts to see what that really looks and feels like when it's in practice. Um, that part I'm really excited about because like I, I said a couple minutes ago, maybe before some of you joined, I you typically give this talk in about 30 minutes. Um, and so we don't get to really get into it and practice it together. Um, so I'm really excited about that part and hopefully you are too. So like I said, my name is Sabia Prescott. My pronouns are she and her. I'm an education policy analyst at a nonprofit a think tank based in Washington, DC in the US. Um, a lot of our work is around policy analysis, mostly at the federal and state level in the US. So my work is primarily domestic focused uh, within the US context. Although um, if any of you are not based in the US, I'm really, really interested to hear um, sort of what this looks like for you um, or, or you know, what it looks like in your own context. Um, I think a lot of it is translatable to a lot of different contexts. So that's also where, where we're sort of thinking forward at the moment. Um, within, the, within the sort of education policy team at New America, I sit um, in an even smaller team called Teaching, Learning, and Tech. Um, and within that sort of smaller team, we talk a lot about open resources and culturally responsive teaching or inclusive and representative teaching um, in education. And so right now in this particular moment in 2020, right, as so many people are focused on digital learning and remote instruction and things like that, we're really thinking about how to, how to sort of marry all of these things together, right? What is seizing this moment um, of digital learning and, and remote learning? Um, what does that look like in terms of making what we're doing more inclusive and more representative? Um, and then in doing that, how can we really utilize open resources? So it's, it's kind of a moment in our own work where we're thinking about all these different things that people have sort of thought of as separate things before, right? That have sort of existed in, in silos and we're thinking about how to bring them together. Um, if it makes sense to bring them together, uh, we think it does, <laughs> but it doesn't mean it's not without challenges. So it's a lot of sort of figuring all of that out. Um, I do have the slides uh, listed in under the presentation for, um, for, for this presentation on the OE Global website in case you wanna access it. And I'm actually gonna go back here for a moment because I should have mentioned it. Um, if you would like the slides to follow along, there's a um, there's a link here at the very top called tinyurl.com slash LGBTQOEG. Um, so if you'd like to access them, um, feel free to do so. Um, so I'd love to hear from all of you all, um, particularly your name, where you are geographically, um, what it is that you do, and then sort of what questions you have going into this workshop. Um, I would love to... I'm thinking about the best way to facilitate this 
um, sort of smoothly. There aren't that many of us. So maybe if I could just ask you to share those things in the order that I see you, um, we can just move through it, if that makes sense to folks. Um, the first person that I see on here is Ellie. Hi, um, <clears throat> my name's Ellie and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here in Golden, Colorado. Um, I'm currently a library student um, and I'm working as an OER graduate student at, um, or graduate assistant at a health sciences library. Um, and um, I'm just really intrigued by this topic. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a former high school educator um, and I always tried to make things as inclusive as possible. Um, that's part of what intrigues me about OER. Um, and, and yeah, I just am excited to see you bridge the gap between the LGBTQ community and OER. So. Awesome, thanks for sharing. The next person I see on here is Nicole. Hi, um, this is a... Also, feel if you if you would rather not turn on video, feel free to not do no, that. No, that's okay. It's totally your choice. People face to face. My name is Nicole Carrier. I work at Norquest College in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and we have snow, lots and lots of snow. <laughs> if you really want them, um, I'm a, I'm an editor and the college's copyright officer, and I work in curriculum development. I'm not. I don't. We're just getting into the OER game. Um, and my role is to edit curriculum as it passes through our department. But a project I've been working on recently, actually for the last couple of years, and it's gonna be unveiled at a seminar next week at a in college conference is uh, inclusive language guidelines for the college. That I, my original intent was that we use them um, for our curriculum. Uh, but I'm also hoping, hoping that they, they gain a wider application throughout the college. We have a very diverse student population. We have students from 183 countries. Um, and, and I think that's in a student population of just under 20,000 students. So, um, and we talk, when we talk about inclusion, it, it often centers on culture and ethnicity and um, gender issues are kind of under the radar a little bit. And so I wanted to create some language guidelines that, that sort of widen the dialogue a little bit. And so I'm here, this is kind of a fact finding mission for me because all information is good. Awesome, thank you for being here. Um, the next person I see is Laura. Hi everyone, Laura Redwine here. Liz and I were just talking about where I'm from right now at Salem, Oregon, but I was from San Diego for most of my life and I love both places and the digital world is where I am now. <laughs> um, I teach graphic design and I um, also have a small graphic design business and uh, work with a, a health company, well company that does health events and now they're all virtual. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so I am realizing, especially now that I am teaching online and when I have my students introduce themselves, um, there's no visual, but they describe who they are. And I'm finding that I don't, admittedly, I don't understand the terms, the gender identities. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but that's why I'm here, right? I'm here to learn and understand. And I want to intentionally include um, some projects and, and information that um, make, make a, a much better holistic, inclusive uh, project and class. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here and for being here to learn. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Next person. I'm sorry, go ahead. The next person I, I see. I, I just said awesome, Savvy. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag on my end. It's probably my internet. Thank you so much for being here. The next person I see is Ksenia. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, yes, sorry. I'm having challenges with my technology, it looks like. Hi. Good. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ksenia Shaman. I am located on um, in Vancouver, BC, in Canada, on the unceded territory of many people. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared to speak. I usually have it all noted down because I can't remember. Uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Soil 
Oh, this is terrible. I really need to practice, you see. Um, I think there's some things that we fail to speak. Sometimes we write them, but when you have to say them out loud, you don't know how. Totally. I need to practice that. Um, what do I do? I work for the Canada School of Public Service. It's a federal government organization that provides training to public service employees. And I'm in the open learning area that's working on open educational resources. Um, I'm also passionate about inclusion in various forms. And uh, I think this topic is very important. And I try to attend and learn as much as I can in terms of events to be a better ally. So thank you for putting that together. What questions do I have? Um, I am looking uh, to find out better strategies and better questions to ask, which I did go through your slides before the session. And I think that's exactly what you're sharing, which is amazing. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks for being here. The last person, I don't see a name, but I do see an awesome jellyfish background. Oh, okay. Hi, I am, I'm Maggie Frankel. I'm a um, OER librarian in uh, San Francisco, California. I also, um, teach library information technology, and I'm a graduate student in an equity and social justice and education program. Um, and I am the LGBT person, but also I'm um, the liaison at my college for um, like the library liaison for LGBT studies, because we do have an LGBT studies program. And so I'm just excited to be here. I know it's K to 12 oriented, but I'm down with that. All right, thanks. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing um, and for being here. And it's really uh, intriguing to me that, that so many of us come from, from sort of different professional backgrounds um, and encouraging in, in a lot of ways, because I think that um, really everyone should care about this in my own opinion, right? So it's, it's cool to see so many different folks here. And thank you for sharing. So before I sort of launch into, I'm gonna spend sort of a, a fair amount of time speaking to you, but I also um, want to sort of check in in between those things. And, and like I said, have a little bit of a discussion and see if, um, you know, if there are any moments um, of where what I'm saying isn't, isn't exactly your experience or, or um, you have some differing thoughts on it, because I think that's really useful to this conversation. Um, so in order for us to sort of uh, be on the same page and have some shared language for uh, having those conversations, I'd like to offer just a couple of um, definitions that I use in my own work, um, which is to say that I did not come up with these. <laughs> they are not copyrighted. They are not um, the one and true definitions for any of these things, but rather sort of the way that these things are talked about in many of my networks with many of the students and the teachers that we speak with um, and in my own professional sort of communities who, who, who do this work. Um, and so for the sake of us sort of approaching this conversation from the same point, I'd like to offer them to you now. Um, the first one, LGBTQ, right, is an acronym. That's maybe the only one that does have kind of a clear, <laughs> clear and definite um, definition. It stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Um, you might have seen um, a di differing versions of this, um, LGBTQIA, QS2, Q+, um, all of those things really are, are meant to be an umbrella term for people of sexual and gender minorities. Um, gender identity is next. This is a big one that we talk about in this work a lot um, and is often a starting point um, in this, especially when we're talking about uh, when we're speaking with, I'm sorry, teachers, um, because uh, I think gender identity and sexuality are, are conflated a lot still, um, primarily among people who are new to this. And we certainly want people who are new to this to, to come into it, right? And so this, I think, is, is a useful thing to start with. So gender identity is just the gender that you are, right? It's really that simple. Um, there are lots of different genders. I don't need to list them here. Um, and at any point, you can there are lots of sort of definitions of those on the internet. Um, one sort of uh, long list I have linked at the end of this uh, slide deck if you'd like to use that one. Um, but it's really just the, the gender that you are um, and that you exist as in the world. Gender presentation can be a little bit different. Um, it's really just the way you present yourself to the world, right? The way you express yourself um, socially, linguistically, sort of visually, the way you dress. Um, I, I present as the way that you're seeing on this screen right now, which is not sort of traditionally feminine, even though I do identify as a cisgender woman. Um, it's people do not read me typically as sort of what they think of traditionally as a feminine person, um, but that is my gender presentation, right? Uh, sexuality are the genders that you're attracted to, right? That could be one gender. Uh, it could be many genders. It could be the one uh, that is the same as yours or different from yours, it's just your sexuality. 
um, non-binary are, are pe non-binary people rather, are people who identify outside of the gender binary, right? Either both male or female or neither male or female or both or sometimes different ones. <laughs> um, it's really people who just don't uh, subscribe to the gender binary. Transgender people are people whose gender identity does not align with the sex they were assigned at birth, right? When I was born, um, a doctor assigned me female and I uh, now identify as a woman. Um, that makes me cisgender, right? Which is the opposite of transgender. Um, if, if today I, was, I identified as a gender um, that was not aligned with what we typically think of as female, um, that would make me transgender or non-binary. Someone can be transgender and non-binary at the same time, um, in case those words are coming up and that seems a little confusing. Those two are not opposite and they're not always mutually exclusive. Someone can be both. And then lastly, pronouns, right? Uh, pronouns are exactly what they sound like, exactly what you're thinking about grammatically, right? The pronouns that someone uses um, when they're referring to you. At the beginning of this, I said that my pronouns were she and her, um, and that's just the way that um, people should refer to me when they're talking about me, the same way that you offer your name so that people can refer to you by your name when they're talking about you. Um, offering pronouns can be useful as well. Um, a, a common non-binary uh, pronoun is they and them, um, although not everyone who uses they and them is non-binary, right? <laughs> um, so it's not always, it's not sort of exactly tied to gender, um, it's just, whatever pronouns are right for that person that they tell you. So those are the ling those are just sort of the sets of language um, that we use to describe this. Um, so as I'm using this, those words rather during this, uh, during this conversation, um, that's really what I'm thinking about. Again, they're not hard and fast. They're not true for every single person, but they're sort of working definitions for how I use them in my work. So defining LGBT inclusion, right? What, what is it? <laughs> what does it look like? Um, what does it feel like? How do you know it when you see it? Specifically, we think about it in terms of materials and texts a lot. I should say we, as in myself and the people on my team who do this work with me. Um, we think about it in terms of materials, right? Instructional materials, textbooks, um, videos, other sort of worksheets and things that students would come across in class. And so how we think of them are materials that allow everyone uh, but especially those with marginalized identities, which includes LGBTQ students, to see themselves reflected and represented. Um, and this does not mean that uh, everything has to be LGBTQ focused all the time forever, right? <laughs> As I'll mention um, in, a, in a few slides from now, but just that they, they are there, right? That LGBTQ people and identities and histories um, and challenges <laughs> are are present in the text. If it's history, then, then it's there. If it's uh, you know ELA, if it's English and language arts, then authors are there. Um, and that they're, that they're represented uh, in a positive light too, right? That it's not just sort of a, a narrative of, of struggle <laughs> and of marginalization every time that it occurs, but rather that it's celebrated. And so again, when we think about it, we think about sort of three different types of, of inclusion in materials. Um, the first one is LGBTQ specific content, right? So think about history um, or again, English language arts. If you're teaching a history lesson um, about uh, you know, San Francisco in the sixties, then probably Harvey Milk would come up. Um, if you're teaching about Stonewall, then certainly LGBTQ identities would come up, right? Uh, there's, there's this content that is specifically about um, and for and hopefully by LGBTQ people. The second one is kind of the opposite, right? Non-LGBTQ specific content. So for example, think about math. Um, I think math is something that most people don't think about when they think about inclusion, but um, a lot of math problems in textbooks for um, primary and secondary uh, sort of level students have word problems, right? And in those word problems are a lot of assumptions, <laughs> are a lot of um, language that is sometimes uh, offering biases or, or particular um, just sort of uh, assumptions both about the people in the word problems and about the reader reading the word problems. And so um, it's pretty rare that you read a math word problem in a history textbook that has um, 
say two female names in it, right? If it's if it's talking about someone's parents in a math word problem, it's almost always a name that you read and assume is sort of a men's name and then a male, uh, a name that you read and assume is a woman's name. Um, and there's really a whole host of other um, other sort of assumptions in there that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but that's a good example of, of where where and when it's possible to make content inclusive when even when it's not sort of specifically focused on LGBTQ people. And then the last one is sort of this idea of queering concepts, right, which is a fundamental part of queer theory, um, which is a whole sort of field of academia, but um, essentially means taking something that is thought to be known or given, right, and questioning it, um, considering it a subject that is worth contemplating further. Um, in elementary and secondary school, take uh, biology, for example, right? Um, there are a lot of concepts in biology that are thought of as sort of fundamental truths, right, of human existence and of our species and of, of what is natural and what is not natural. Um, and many of these things are sort of built on assumptions that we use to construct um, truth um, of human sex and gender um, and to sort of um, consider those things and interrogate them and interrogate our own assumptions and biases about them and, and how we came to these ideas that we think of as, as fundamental truths. Um, is queering it, right? Is queering biology. <laughs> um, and there, there are other uh, subjects as well where, where that sort of thing comes up. But those are the three sort of types of inclusion that, that we think about most often in this work. And so just like it's important to, to think about what exactly inclusion is, I think it's really important to think about what it's not also. Um, what I think queer inclusion is not um, is, is mapping queer experiences onto the default sort of mainstream mold, right? Um, there are certainly examples, again, we'll talk about them later, later in the slides, where it can be really useful to replace names uh, or to just replace pronouns. And sometimes um, sort of creating more linguistic inclusion is as simple as that, but sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes it's not um, very useful to just take a sort of, um, tired or <laughs> extremely overtly heterosexual um, scenario that appears on something like a math word problem and just insert uh, names that, that kind of sound like you're, you assume they're the same gender. Um, sometimes that's actually counterintuitive to what's going on. The second one is overcompensating to make everything LGBTQ inclusive um, or focused, right? Um, this is one that we see a lot. It's, it's, it's not necessary, <laughs> right? To, to create inclusion is, is not to say that you have to take all content everywhere and make sure that um, LGBTQ people are like front and center in it always. It's not necessarily that. It's just where, what, certainly when the content ought to include LGBTQ uh, people, for example, when they're um, sort of the protagonist in the story or in the <laughs> history historical event, um, then of course, but not, not all content, you know, that's not the case for all content. So um, where it is appropriate and where it makes sense is one thing, um, but it's not to say that all content has to change drastically. And then the last one, LGBTQ inclusive materials that are not intersectional, right? Intersectional being this idea that there are overlapping systems of oppression that are sort of born out of someone holding multiple marginalized identities, um, that they experience the world um, in varying ways based on the identities that we hold. Um, we see this a lot in, in YA lit, in, in young adult literature and in children's books. Um, there are more and more children's books these days that include LGBTQ characters and protagonists, which is great. Um, that's really exciting to see, right? Um, but a lot of them, a lot, a lot of them um, feature the most uh, privileged people within this marginalized community, right? And for LGBTQ people, that's cisgender, white, sort of affluent uh, gay men, right? And there's, that's, that's it. That's, that's by and large, like what exists in textbooks. Um, when in reality, LGBTQ people exist in every other demographic of the population, right? Um, there is no one LGBTQ experience or story or something like that. But when that's all that we see in textbooks or in stories or in word problems, um, whatever it is, then that's what that's what we think it is. That's what we think as the LGBTQ experience and the story. And we read that one story and we think that's it and that's fine. Um, but that leaves out really a whole host of other experiences and stories and narratives. And so there's a danger there um, in, in not sort of lifting up vo intersectional voices and experiences. 
actually, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to take a quick pause and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts or sort of anything they want to raise about that before I move on. I've definitely noticed what you've noticed in the um, in the YA literature, um, where it's either yeah, it's super privileged about super privileged white kids. The other thing I've noticed is they tend to like um, some of them. Some of the young adult books tend to um, just kind of I want to say like gay wash a character, or like um, you know they they an author just you know. Just, just fits in an LGBT character just to, you know, make it convenient. And like, I can tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, that's definitely true. Um, I, I've noticed that a lot on like Netflix shows recently I have a lot of, um, it's still kind of the same trope of like straight characters in a rom-com and, but they just have like a gay best friend. Right? <laughs> and it's like, someone's just checked that box. Someone on their marketing team has said, you're good. Um, it's the same thing with like their black best friend. <laughs> it's or whatever it is um and and it's it's you can definitely tell you're right <laughs> you can tell when that story was not designed for that character right um i i uh, uh, sort of soapbox that is not difficult to get me to is uh, love simon um and i think that that's a great story it's a sweet story <laughs> it's great to see lgbtq young characters on a tv show um, and for people whose experiences that that is, then it's probably very realistic. Um, but it's it in 2019 or whenever that movie was released. If you're not familiar, it's a story about a young, a young, white gay boy who lives in a wealthy suburb, and um, he has some difficulty coming out to his parents, and then he does, and they're accepting, and that's great. <laughs> it's not that we don't need that story, but but uh, you know when when that is the movie about young people coming out, then that is the story about young people coming out. And it just doesn't look like that for so many people. Um, and I think books are, are sort of verging on the same, the same danger there. Um, all right, so what does this have to do with um, open educational <laughs> resources? Um, this is a question that I get a lot because I think people like want to have want it to have something to do with it because they're interested in both of these things. Um, and I'm here to tell you that they do have something in common. Um, and here's here's what I think it is. Um, the, the benefit to using OER, um, as we say a lot, to leveraging open resources for LGBTQ inclusion um, are that anyone can access and use OER, right? The point is that they're open and there are these things that everyone has access to. And therefore um, we want to make them more inclusive. Um, and especially um, with OER being sort of this realm of, of fewer gatekeepers in terms of authors, um, that's a really useful thing because there are not a lot of um, queer textbook writers, <laughs> um, which would be very clear to you if you look up any textbook um, that has queer content in it or any explanation of queer identities and read them, it becomes very obvious that someone who is um, <laughs> not queer or trans uh, wrote that. And so to, to be able to get more queer and trans authors into this space is a, a need, a clear need, and OER offers the possibility of doing that. Uh, OER can also be adapted and updated to reflect evolving understanding of LGBTQ identities, right? Um, those language pieces that we talked about at the beginning, um, those definitions, if this, if we were talking in this meeting 30, 20, <laughs> two years ago, right, um, we, we may not have used those same definitions. Our, our understandings of queer identities and of queer people um, change over time. They, they are updated constantly. Um, and it's really helpful to have uh, an adaptable text that is able to evolve along with our understanding of queer identities. Um, and that's something that of course is, is not the case in traditional proprietary textbooks, which again are often 30 or 20 years old. Um, and so sort of uh, writing this content, even if we were to do that now into proprietary textbooks that students are then gonna use for 20 years in a classroom um, is probably not as useful as something that can be updated um, regularly. And then lastly, OER are just becoming more widely used, particularly this year, um, at least in the US, more and more teachers are, are, are um, relying on open resources uh, because students are not in the classroom, um, whether it's because 
those digital technologies that they're now being asked to use are too expensive or it's because you know they can't physically get the textbooks that they were using out to students who are learning from home. Um, more and more people are relying on open resources. And so it's important that those resources are inclusive um, and are high quality. And in this context, I'm using high quality to mean inclusive. Um, that's a big ask that we sort of put out there every, every time we speak on this work is that those two things should be synonymous, right? If something is not inclusive and representative and reflective of the students learning from it, um, then it's not a very good resource, right? Um, it, it can't really by definition be effective. So again, I'll just pause to see if anyone um, sort of has any immediate reactions or thoughts or questions to any of that. Um, like I said, and we'll keep saying it is, it is entirely my take on this. So if you have a different one, I'd love to hear it. Hearing nothing, I will move on. Um, so LGBTQ materials and open, right? Um, what is it? What does it actually look like <laughs> in order to be able to do this? This next slide is a repeat, I think. Yes, it is. Um, the process of actually making things inclusive, um, as I'm gonna talk about on the very next slide, is a process, right? Um, the very first thing that people sort of launch into it, again, when I when I give this talk, which is sometimes only 20 minutes long and we don't actually get into the, the part where we do it, um, is you know people asking what okay this sounds great like it all sounds great being inclusive and and queer kids and great <laughs> but how do we do it right what does it actually look like if i'm sitting down with other teachers or with students even or with my administration uh with librarians hopefully <laughs> what does it look like when we're doing this um and my answer is always that it's a process um it has to be done together it has to involve all of the stakeholders um very ideally it will involve student voice in it um, because students know what they want to learn, right? <laughs> um, they know mostly who they are or, or what things are out there for them to learn. Um, and they wanna see that in the texts that they're learning in school, they want to be engaged. Um, we have to do it by learning all of us all the time. Um, someone at the beginning of this mentioned that um, sort of an embarrassment of not knowing um, everything and I'm here to say please don't be embarrassed. Um, it's a learning process for all of us, certainly myself included, all of the time. I think that I have a pretty good handle on this as my organization's resident queer person and the person talking about this most of the time. Um, and then I go to talk to students, right, who are like 16 and 17 and they have like words that I've never heard of. <laughs> Like it like wasn't that long ago that I was in high school, but um, but it really reminds me always that that there's always more learning to do, in part because because our language does change and our understanding changes, but also because like I said, there there are an infinite number of queer experiences and identities out there, um, and it's just we we don't all know all of them. Um, thirdly, it has to be done with intention, right? Um, it's this is not something that is just kind of inevitably gonna be better if we don't take an active role in it. Um, it has to be done intentionally and, um, and thoughtfully over time. And it's something that takes a while and can be hard and can be really uncomfortable, but, um, but it does require that. And then lastly, it happens constantly. Um, it's an ongoing process. It's um, something that maybe your, your classroom or a group of people you know, or students or your district even commits to um, one year or three years. And then the very next year after that, you have to rethink it because so much has changed. Um, it is constant, which makes it sound insurmountable, but it's not that either. And it's also true that small changes can go a long way. Um, and so it's not, it's not, as if it's this sort of long ongoing process with no end goal, but rather that the things you accomplish during the process um, contribute to uh, the progress of it, right? And students notice, teachers notice, um, LGBTQ teachers are not outside of this work. In fact, they mostly have to shoulder this work in the districts <laughs> that they're in, which is not fair either, but um, that there are so many stakeholders who are part of this um, and it has, to, it has to be an ongoing process. So what, so what does it look like, right? What is it? Um, finally, here we are. Before I get into sort of some of the questions that I sort of ask of content when I'm thinking about it, 
um, just a couple of sets of considerations um, that I want to offer um, as we're thinking about them. The first one is student agency. Uh, like I referenced a couple of times, um, students have to have a voice in this, right? And not only that, but um, as, as you're thinking about this work in your own context or classrooms or libraries or communities, I urge you to sort of think about what agency students have in the process, right? To decide which content they want to learn about. Um, do they have agency in accessing information about current events um, that directly impact them? And who's there to help them through that process, right? Um, when I was, anecdotally, when I was in high school, um, I'm from Maine in the US, um, which is a, a very rural, um, homogenous area. And uh, I had no idea that this information existed. I didn't know that queer identities existed. Um, not because necessarily I was in sort of a, a small homophobic town or anything. I just, I just didn't know because it wasn't taught in school ever. Um, and so if someone had asked me at that point, I wouldn't even have known what I was missing out on, right? Um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to say this whole content area, this whole area of history, these types of authors is what I want to learn about because I didn't even know that existed. Um, and so what agency do students have in actually being able to identify what it is they want to learn and then being able to learn that. And then secondly, teacher preparation, right? Um, teacher professional learning, teacher development, teacher preparation. Um, is a big, big part of this work. Um, it has been the focus of entire reports and events and series that we've done because um, it it's, doesn't do much good to sort of fill textbooks or fill materials or create entire resources that have all this language that teachers themselves might not be prepared to teach, right? Um, even if a teacher has the best of intentions, and, and many do, um, in terms of wanting to, to be better for students, to create really inclusive and welcoming learning environments for students, um, which extends to materials. If those teachers are not prepared um, and comfortable to teach that content, um, then, then we've done something wrong, right? <laughs> then we're leaving out a really big piece of this puzzle. Um, so are teachers prepared to teach the content that students most want to learn? Um, and then secondly, what might help them become more comfortable in um, teaching inclusive content such as LGBTQ history or stories? Um, and some of this is as simple as, um, you know, providing the language um, and helping, helping teachers to understand sort of what, what's out there, what queer authors are out there or um, sort of how to, how to be there for students, right? Um, who may want to talk to them or things like that. Um, but some of it is really sort of like bias training <laughs> that exists. Some of it, some of it happens on a not intentional level, right? Um, because we don't know. And like, like for teachers, as like for all of us, um, this is an ongoing process. And so what does, what does teacher professional development look like um, for this work specifically? And I'll add on top of that, especially right now, um, there's this question of where does this fit in, right? Because as we know of all teachers, almost everywhere, I think, at least in the US, um, they're underpaid and they already have way too much on their plate. And especially this year, they have like so many things going on that they didn't sign up for. Um, and it's just a lot already. They're managing so much and they're being asked to be a hero to everyone in their life. Um, and so how do we make what they're already doing um, learning events for them? How do we make, how do we help them help students um, make the learning environments more inclusive without, without offering LGBTQ sort of teacher preparation as something that's sort of an additional ask for them, right? So the next few slides are going to be some sort of questions um, that I think about when I think of what inclusive content looks like. Um, and they're broken down into, again, <laughs> what I think of as sort of three types of queer inclusive content that you can ask of materials when you're looking through them. The first one is gendered language. The second one is visual representation. I should say visual and sort of content representation. And then the third one is non-LGBTQ specific considerations. So the next three slides, we'll go over those more specifically. So first of all, gender language, right? Um, when you have a text in front of you, when you have an open text that you're allowed to edit and adapt and change and share back out, right? Um, what 
gender pronouns are used. Um, when and where are they used, right? When I say gender pronouns, I mean she and he. Um, where could gender neutral pronouns, such as they, although there are other ones as well, um, where could those be used, right? Um, and that question is really meant to ask, where could they be used? Not that they should be used in all contexts all the time, because that's not necessary either. Really a diversity of pronouns and of names and of um, visuals uh, is useful, but on occasion, um, gender neutral pronouns such as they can likely be inserted into the text. The second question that I ask of content here is what gender stereotypes does the content evoke, right? Um, there are just about a bajillion gendered stereotypes in our world. <laughs> uh, many of them we probably are not thinking consciously about um, when we use them. Many of them are built into the language that we use, the idioms, the metaphors that we use all the time. Um, but if you really stop and think about it, it's they, they really jump out of the page. <laughs> um, they're clear if you're really combing through the text um, and trying to see where gendered stereotypes show up. Um, for example, are there names in the text that you sort of immediately think of as male names? Um, are they wearing blue? Are they playing sports? Are they building things? Are they driving trucks? <laughs> are there names that you think of as generally feminine or female names? Talking about dresses, are they shopping? Are they doing nails? It sounds like that's kind of an obvious, those are obvious examples, but again, you'd be surprised if, um, if you <laughs> go through the text to look for those things. The third one here is what gendered assumptions underlie the content. Again, um, sort of similarly to stereotypes, there are a lot of assumptions um, that are there when we're when we're thinking about sort of what what picture the text is painting. Um, and we're going to have an example uh, in just a couple of slides about that one in particular. Which one am I on? Assumptions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so number three, what gendered assumptions underlie the content? And then number four, what gendered assumptions underlie the names that are used, right? Like I mentioned, the a little bit of a tricky thing is that uh, in, in sort of LGBTQ community and queer theory in general, um, there's the idea is that names don't have genders, right? Any name could be any gender, any person can be any gender. Um, and so it's difficult to sort of point out gender, quote unquote, gendered names. Um, that being said, there are assumptions that are associated with names, right? If you see the name Bill in a text, you're gonna, you're gonna visually be thinking about a man um, because of society's <laughs> sort of associations with, with masculinity and with that name. And so sort of a way around that is just to offer a diversity of names, right? Are there names that people generally read as male? Are there names that people generally read as, as female or feminine? Are there names that people may not know whether it's male or female um, or not know, but make assumptions about, right? So just a variety of names um, are, can be useful to have in text. And then number five, um, this is sort of a more nitty gritty, um, are, are sort of, um, Miss, Mr. or Mrs. used in the text. Um, each of these is, is gendered, right, uh, in some way that we're thinking about. Could they be similarly to pronouns up at the top? Could they be replaced with gender neutral term, uh, which is pronounced mix? Um, that's thought of as a gender neutral uh, term instead of Mrs. or Mr. Or could it just be eliminated entirely? Um, often there's just like unnecessarily gendered things in text <laughs> and everywhere. Um, could it just, could you just take that out and it would still have the same meaning? Uh, maybe you could, and maybe you couldn't. Um, again, this is just a question to sort of get you to think about that. Before I move on, do any other questions, does anyone have any questions about any of these questions <laughs> or do you have anything that you would add to this list? Or anything that feels not right about this list or any questions? I think uh, this is great. This is often an aspect overlooked, I find. So I think it's really valuable that we put together so many different questions around this, especially removing things that are not necessary. I think um, I do a lot of reading on the French uh, language and um, you uh, has a particular term that they use for kind of uh, gender free writing. There's a lot of debates about how to do because of the French language, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's very gendered because the nouns are gendered. 
Um, so there's some really interesting, you know, debates there. And in those communities, there is a lot of talk about if we wanted to make a text more neutral, how do we do that? Um, and there's all kinds of practices and then how do they interact with accessibility it's really fascinating in english it's much simpler if you think about it so frankly implementing this as something rigorous to review your work seems really um, doable so i think you've put together a good framework for that yeah absolutely that actually what you're saying reminds me of um, a blog post that i read recently from a from a researcher at an organization called um, coral which is uh, an acronym for something that i don't remember but they um uh, the, the author who wrote it is French and she focuses on um, queer inclusion in the classroom a lot and she wrote this blog post about um, exactly what you're saying about how it's it's difficult in languages that are so linguistically that are so uh, gendered with things like nouns like the English language does not have um, and I think that's really fascinating and um, and a consideration that most people don't think about again because we often think of it as the sort of anglo-saxon uh, perspective when we think about queer inclusion in the classroom but um in in reality other languages and other cultures are doing this better than we are already so that's fascinating um, all right moving on to the second one here um visual and content representation right um, what are you seeing in the in the text and what are you seeing visually, which is equally as important when you're reading through content and open texts? The first question I have here is, are masculine, feminine, and sort of androgynous present, presenting people portrayed in roughly equal rates in photos, right? Similarly to the belief that, that names don't really have a gender, um, visual gender presentations are not sort of necessarily uh, aligned with masculinity or femininity, right? Um, Non-binary people can look like anything. Um, men can look like anything, <laughs> right? Cisgender people can look like anything. Um, but that being said, uh, are, is there a diversity of, of gender presentation in the images, in the videos, um, in any other sort of visuals that you have in the context? Um, just to sort of get you thinking about, does, does it always look like people of sort of one demographic or not? The second one is, is there visual diversity among the LGBTQ people portrayed, right? Um, again, similarly to the, the sort of single story narrative um, that we were talking about earlier, visibly queer, quote unquote, visibly queer people who hold additional marginalized identities are, are not often um, showing up in textbooks. When we do see um, what we assume to be queer people in textbooks, they mostly look like me, right? They look like either flamboyant white gay men as, as we sort of stereotypically think about them, or they look like women like me who have flannel shirts on and short haircuts and are like a lumberjack or something, right? They're always building on stereotypes. Um, but again, in reality, there are um, literally thousands of different LGB LGBTQ uh, presentations and experiences and, um, and gender expressions. And so um, having a, a diversity of those in your visuals is really important. Uh, number three, is there an LGB LGBTQ specific section of the content? Uh, and should there be, right? Um, like I said, it's, it's not always, it shouldn't always pull focus in things where it's not about this, but um, for example, if, if you're talking about a, an historical event where an LG, LGBTQ person um, had a great influence in that particular historical event, um, then they should probably be acknowledged, right? Um, and something, a question that I get a lot is, you know, what, what difference does it make? Um, for if it's not sort of if it wasn't like Harvey Milk or if it wasn't Stonewall, then like what difference does it make for a student to know sort of like that person's sexuality, right? Um, and that's a totally fair question. Like why why would it make a difference, right? And my response is representation matters. Um, a, a good example of this is Alan Turing, right? Um, the scientist. Um, most people oh, don't. I shouldn't say most people don't know. I have no idea what people know, <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of textbooks about him don't don't teach about his sort of uh, sexual gender identity um, because of his, just his robust contributions to science, which were great. But um, for a young queer student in a classroom to know that someone like them made that significant uh, contribution to history and to science, um, it actually matters a lot, right? It matters to know that someone 
that you perceive to be like you um, did great things. It says that you can do great things. <laughs> um, and so if, if, there, if there are examples of that where that could be mentioned um, or it could be acknowledged and celebrated in the text, in the stories that are being told, um, then the text should do that. And then number four, if history, uh, ELA, English language arts, or general humanities, if it's one of sort of one of these three general categories, um, does the content mention LGBTQ historical figures, icons, events, uh, or influences where appropriate? Again, um, I think influences is also really key, right? When we're thinking about sort of um, LGBTQ civil rights history, um, there are a lot of other really big events in, for example, in American history uh, going on at that same time. <laughs> and I think for that reason, partially because of that reason, um, that's not really mentioned that much. It's certainly not mentioned in mainstream proprietary textbooks, but it had influences far outside of like San Francisco in 1969, right? It, it had big influences in what was going on in the country. Um, and that's, those, those stories are really not woven in that content, that context, excuse me, um, is not very acknowledged um, very much in, in textbooks outside of um, sort of things that are specifically focused on queer and trans people. Um, but it can provide outside of, of allowing students to sort of see themselves in the context, it can often just add, um, you know, truth value to what was going on to help students understand the full, um, sort of the full context of what was going on in the world if we're talking about history or humanities. All right. The third and final one, I know I'm talking quickly and we're moving through this quickly, but again, please stop me if you have any questions. Um, next, uh, next after this one, we're going to um, sort of go through a couple examples of this to see what it see what it looks like. Um, but lastly, non-specific, excuse me, non-LGBTQ specific considerations, right? Like I said, LGBTQ people exist in every other demographic um, on this earth. It's they, we are everywhere. <laughs> we exist in in every population, and so things that are uh, meant to include. Um, specifically other sort of types, uh, demographics, categories of people are also queer inclusive, right? Um, there's overlap there. So the first couple are about um, sort of physical accessibility, right? Is the content in black and white font? Um, is, it, is there sharp contrast between the text and the background? Um, is it a normal size? Is it Arial or Times New Roman? Those two fonts, right, are, are uh, thought to be the most sort of accessible to read on screens and in text. Um, is there alt text provided for the photos, right? Alt text being the description of what's in the photos for people who use screen readers and anyone who would like to read it. And really importantly, is the alt text accurate? Is it descriptive? And is it free of personal bias, right? If, if someone is relying on alt text to understand what, what photos are in the materials that they're reading, um, and that text includes just a bunch of, um, you know, homophobic biases, then that's not very useful, right? Um, that is not the representation and the inclusion that that person really needs to be able to access this content. Um, number three, are there audio clips of the printed text available? Um, is it available in more than one way, right? Um, in order for content to be actually inclusive and actually accessible and actually open, <laughs> um, we want people to be able to um, get to it, to access it in, in any way that they're able to do that. Number four, um, consider the point of view of the author, right? This is a big one. Is the content presented through a white lens? Um, what privileges must be, must you have as the reader to understand the point of view of the author? Um, this is a really big one in American textbooks specifically. Um, which are nearly always written from a white lens, a white perspective, um, celebrating whiteness <laughs> and ignoring everything else, right? Um, this is a big one, especially it's, it's not always thought of, I think, as queer inclusion, but it certainly is, and it should be because queer people are not all white. In fact, statistically, most of us are not white. Um, and so this is a really important one when we're thinking about um, queer narratives, right? Like we were talking about um, queer stories and points of view. And then finally, uh, in word problems, back to the, the example of math, right? <laughs> what hypotheticals um, or examples are used? Which, which backgrounds must someone come from in order to understand these examples? Um, we're gonna talk about this in just a minute, but 
um, essentially another way to get you to think about sort of what do you need to know in order to be able to access the content that's happening, right? Um, does it have just a lot of assumptions built into it and a lot of knowledge that you have to hold in order to even be able to understand it? Um, because if that's the case, it's probably not very accessible. Right. I'm going to pause one more time um, before we move on and talk about um, a couple of real examples and, and see what that looks like. Anyone have any anything else they would add to this? Any issues with any of these things or any thoughts? There's a pretty loud noise. I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, so to unsplash, I think it was, so there's a couple. Um, and I put in a blog post to uh, cccoer.org. We have a equity, diversity, and inclusion blog series, and they're putting the link to one. It has um, finding diverse photos, not just uh, LGBTQ+, plus, but um, all kinds of diverse photos. Laurie put in Pixabay, Unsplash, or MoveVertigo.com. So just... Sorry, I, I, uh, I'll mute myself again because apparently I have a lot of background noise. Sorry, there's a, I, I don't know if other folks can hear that, but I was having a trouble hearing you because there was a repetitive noise. It sounded like you were sharing resources, if that's the case. Um, hopefully, uh, maybe in the chat here. Oh, I see in the chat, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we can't hear you clearly. Um, maybe you could put in the chat uh, with what, what you were saying, or if you were sharing resources, you could share them there. Sorry about that. Zoom's given up for the day, it's over. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna... Uh, Go ahead and move on then to our uh, our examples. Um, and this is the last thing that I have. Uh, I have three examples, but they're the last thing that I have here. So um, hopefully we'll be able to end uh, a little bit early and give, give folks some part of their day back. Um, so just to walk you through again, just so we can sort of feel out together what this looks like, what this feels like um, when we're sort of applying some of these questions. Um, this first example is from a seventh grade American uh, open math textbook. It's uh, in the US, that's about ages 12 to 13, right? Um, and I will read it out loud since it's not very long. The example, the excerpt says, uh, William is a homeowner trying to sell his house. He has to pay his real estate agent, John, 7% commission. He wants to make at least $150,000 on the sale after he pays John. What price to the nearest dollar does William need to sell his house for in order to make at least $150,000? Um, so that is the word problem. Um, so my question to you all is, and feel free to answer, just uh, just say it out loud or feel free to um, have it in the chat. I'm sorry, I'm not great at multitasking. So I hadn't looked at the chat until now, but now that I'm here, um, I see uh, that Nicole wrote in the chat, traditionally men buy and sell houses, right? Um, yes, right. There are a lot of um, gender assumptions in this, right? Um, sort of re reinforcing the idea that, um, that men particularly, um, not just any men, right? But William and John are kind of commonly read as white male names um, are people who buy homes, right? Um, so it's sort of reinforcing that stereotype. Um, anything else that anyone notices about this in particularly, uh, what is sort of required knowledge in order to, to do this problem? Money, yes, yes, money. I don't know about you, but I didn't. I didn't exactly know what a home buying commission was when I was twelve years old, right? Um, a class assumption, Cindy. Absolutely. 
Um, I, I had no idea what a commission was when I was 12 years old. I was not buying a home then. Uh, my parents were not buying a home. Um, there's absolutely a class sort of um, uh, a set of a class associated set of knowledge here that you have to know in order to be able to even do this problem in the first place on top of the sort of reinforcing the gender uh, assumptions of who is a home buyer and who is not a home buyer. Um, this one is the one that I start with because it's uh, one, in my opinion, that would not be so hard to, to add a couple of smaller tweaks to um, in order to make it, you know, not in order to sort of address some of the biases that are in it. The names in particular, um, I would, I could change, right? You could change them to names that are thought of as uh, women's names or names that are sometimes thought of as androgynous or both male and female names. Um, there are a lot of he, him, his pronouns uh, in here, right? You could change those. Um, as far as the commission, you could say what a commission is, right? <laughs> or you could just say, you know, he, he has to pay John 7% of, of the cost that the house sells for. Um, there, there are just some smaller tweaks to this, right? Does anyone notice, anyone notice anything else about this or would change it in any other way? That's the easiest example. It's the least egregious example, I should say. <laughs> example number two, um, this one is, uh, a, this is a sort of excerpt from a year seven British textbook, um, which is also about ages 12 to 13. I'll read it aloud again. It says in town A, 70% of the men are married to 90% of the women. What percentage of the adult population in town A are married? What do you notice about this one? Men first. Yes, men are always first, aren't they? <laughs> it doesn't even it doesn't even put the women first. Absolutely. What else do you notice? What stands out to you about this? What assumptions are being made in this one? Yes, men. Ellie says, um, men can only marry women. Right. It is absolutely making that assumption um, that that is uh, kind of a brass assumption, if if you ask me, that all the people in this town are straight um, and that they're all uh, marrying the opposite sex. Um, I put that in air quotes because men are is not the opposite of women. Um, it, we can talk about that more in the resources at the end of this. Um, but yes, it is, it is assuming heterosexuality rather strongly and weirdly for a math problem, if you ask me. Um, Right, Mar and the underlying assumption there, Xenia is absolutely right in the chat. She says marriage is only considered valid if it is heterosexual. Yes, it is somehow saying all of these things in two sentences. <laughs> um, and so, like I said at the beginning, it's it sounds, when you're sort of describing the biases that that can pop up, it sounds, um, it's it's easy to think that that sounds, you know, very outdated and and what, what kind of texts still say that, but like they do, right? <laughs> um, and when you're sort of, were you thinking about it? Um, it it becomes very clear. I think um, Liz says, "I'm assuming everyone is cisgendered." Yes, <laughs> it makes all of these all of these brass assumptions in two sentences. Um, what would you change about this if you're going to rewrite this? Um, what, what? How would you change it? while people are thinking or typing or both. Um, back to Laura's comment from earlier, Alex is a good name and they use they, them, um, plus describe what a commission is right from that last one. Um, Alex is a good example of, an, of names that are often thought of as both female or male names, um, which again, any I'm here to tell you any name can be any gender, but people do read it cert a certain way. So intentionally including that is a great idea. Alex is a good example. So back to this one, right? Um, People, yes, people, gender neutral words for groups, right? People is a great one. Um, everyone's people. Uh, you could just, <laughs> you could just say that. Um, 
or make it not about marriage. Yes, that's another great one um, because marriage, right, is sort of a traditionally a heterosexual institution um, and uh, and it doesn't have to be about that. And probably uh, you're exactly right that 12 year olds are not like very concerned with who's getting married to whom. Uh, couldn't it be something else? Yes, yes, you all, you all got it. Um, group orange, group green, yes. Um, things like sort of silly, silly names or colors or um, <laughs> uh, whatever it is for for describing groups of people in ways that are not hyper gendered, right? Like men and women um, are a really great way to get around that. All right, moving on to number three, our final one. Um, this is an excerpt on sexuality specifically from a university level Canadian open textbook. I'll read it out loud. Um, these two sentences I just numbered because they're from the same paragraph in this excerpt, but they're not um, sequential. So the first one says, transgender females are males who have such a strong emotional and psychological connection to the feminine aspects of society that they identify their gender as female. The second sentence says, transgender individuals who attempt to alter their bodies through medical interventions, such as surgery and hormonal therapy, so that their physical being is better aligned with their gender identity are called transsexuals. Um, I see folks sharing um, links in the text, in the chat rather. Thank you for sharing those, that's great. Um, so when you read these two sentences, um, Sydney, no problem. Uh, when you read these two sentences, what stands out to you about the content specifically? What do you notice? What questions do you have? Um, blatant transphobia. They yes. might not even realize how transphobic it is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yes, the, you're exactly right. Um, this, I believe, was written by someone with good intentions and goodwill. <laughs> um, and it's a perfect example of why uh, impact is, is much more important than intentions, right? Um, and also, uh, what happens when, when content is not written by queer authors? Um, I don't know this person who wrote this. Um, it's listed because it's an open resource. Um, I have no idea who they are, but um, but I can almost guarantee you that they're not a queer or trans person, right? Um, and the reason that I can tell that, not just because it's, it's obvious and everyone should know that it's obvious, but the reason that I can tell that is because the language is outdated, right? Um, transsexual, for example, is, not a, is, is no longer a phrase that's in use. Um, transgender male and female is not, is not typically a, a phrases that are in use anymore since we, since we usually think of uh, female and male um, as sort of having to do with biological um, or medical uh, sort of context. Instead, when we're talking about sort of social constructs of gender identity, we usually talk about men and women um, and therefore say uh, transgender men or transgender woman or person. Um, that's sort of one uh, indicator to me that this is sort of outdated. Um, another is that it's uh, pretty invalidating, right? Um, trans females are males <laughs> um, is, not, uh, is not true. That's not like an accurate statement. Um, what, if you're reading something like this and it seems helpful, but you're not quite sure if it's accurate information or not, um, there are just about a bajillion resources that you could go to that are sort of tried and true. <laughs> um, and I link a lot of them in these slides here um, where you could sort of feel out whether or not the language is sort of updated and relevant. Um, I, what I appreciate, the reason that I pull out this sort of very egregious example is that um, I think that it's useful to sort of see what is out there, especially in OER um, spaces and, and materials. This textbook is in OER Commons. Um, you can go there looking for it. And more than that, it's one of the very few texts on um, gender and sexuality specifically. There are not a lot that are openly licensed. And so if you are someone looking to learn about this for the first time, um, this is what you're gonna see if you're looking at open materials. Um, and that's pretty concerning, right? Um, and as people who are sort of committed to this, um, this work and, and accurate information being out there, um, I think we do have, have uh, a duty really to, to make sure that the information that is there, again, the open materials that people are, are relying on more and more now, um, you know, make sure that they're accurate and, and useful information. So 
before we wrap up, um, any other lingering questions or thoughts or comments or feelings? <laughs> Feel free to say it out loud or, or throw it in the chat. And thank you to everyone who's um, sharing resources and links in the chat. That's great. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. I have a question. Um, it's, it's just a question I have because of the online learning situation. It's uh, much different than face to face. Mm -hmm. And I always welcome all my great diverse creative students, their graphic designers, or they're going towards graphic design, or maybe they're just taking a Photoshop class to learn a little bit about image manipulation. And I get all kinds of great folks and I enjoy talking to them and their stories and their diversity. Um, but when I'm faced with an online discussion group, um, everyone's introducing themselves and they introduce themselves with the gender identities that I mentioned before that I, I need to brush up on. And what's your suggestion? Does anyone have a good suggestion for if someone introduces themselves and they happen to mention that they're cis, gay, or whatever, however they identify themselves, um, I usually just just inter just say hi and and I just kind of skip over that part, you know, because they're, they're, I don't want to put, call attention to it. I don't want to seem rude. Maybe I'm approaching it the wrong way. Does anyone have a suggestion for me? I'll share my, my immediate reaction um, and then invite anyone else to as well. Um, I, I so appreciate this question because I think it, it comes from a real place of caring and, um, and I appreciate that you asked it. Um, my, my typical go-to is to say, thank you for sharing that. Um, right. I think just like you, you mentioned, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be a uh, broadcast, um, but it also ought to not be ignored. Right. Um, I, I think trying to build a community, um, especially one online, like you said, which, which I imagine is, is really a lot harder than it is in person, um, to make those personal connections. Um, I think that difference in that way ought to, ought to be accepted, right? We can recognize difference. Difference among us is there. Um, and it's something to be celebrated, right? It's not something to be ignored, um, but, but it is there. And so if, when, when people share that with me, um, especially online, I just say, thank you so much, you know, for sharing that part of you. Um, and then, you know, if it's not sort of the, the point of the conversation, then, then the conversation moves on. Does anyone else have anything to, to add on to that? I'd just like to say thank you so much for that. That is that is a beautiful perspective and I love it. And that's what I'll do. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. Absolutely. I love that question. Any other questions or thoughts or or anything on, on anything we talked about? All right, then I'm hearing nothing. I'm going to move on to, oops, to my very last slide, which is just to share some more resources with you all. I so appreciate everyone putting, um, sharing the resources in the chat. Um, Liz, is there a way to, is Liz on here still? Maybe. I am, yes. Oh, hi. <laughs> sorry, I didn't see you in the chat. Is there a way to um, capture the, the chat um, and be able to hold on to those resources that were shared? Yeah, I will automatically, anybody in here can save the chat um, and, right. and then um, I will get a version when I close the meeting. I can share those links on uh, the OE Global um, post for this session. That would be awesome. Thank you. And thank you for reminding me. I always forget that you can just <laughs> save the chat. Um, and I'm like asking everyone else on the internet how to do that. Um, thank you. That's great. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to share a couple resources um, that I have with you all. And again, um, the link to uh, this, this slide deck that I've used and all, all of these things here are live links as well. Um, so if you can access that is on the under the presentation on OE Global's website for the conference. Um, the first one is 
uh, just the, all the questions that I presented to you here in a Word doc, so it's a little bit easier to look at. Um, number two and three are reports that we've, our own reports um, that we've written at New America on uh, LGBTQ inclusive teaching and another one on learning. So one from the teacher side, one from the student side. Um, number four is uh, Teaching Tolerance, which is an organization based out of the Southern Poverty Law Center um, in the U.S. They do, <coughs> excuse me, they do um, lots of great work in this area. And one of the most sort of foundational resources they have is their glossary of terms. It has every term that you would ever think of. And they have young people who work there and they update it all the time. So you know that that's like a good place um, to go for language. Um, if you just hear something and you don't know what that means um, or you want to learn more. Um, I don't include that in, in this uh, presentation because it makes people feel like they have to memorize every term on that list in order to engage with this work. And that's not true either, but it's a good resource to hold on to. Um, number five is a list of resources that I curate with uh, teachers and administrators that I work with most often. It has books, it has YouTube videos, TED Talks, podcasts, Twitter feeds, all kinds of stuff, um, all about the things that we've just talked about. And then number six is um, an LGBTQ studies open textbook. It's aimed at higher ed. Um, it was uh, sort of spearheaded by Deb Amory at uh, SUNY uh, Empire State College in New York. Um, but it has uh, tons of authors, uh, myself included, <laughs> in one very small part of it, but lots of other people more brilliant than I am who wrote that textbook. Um, and again, it's updated um, all the time and has lots of great content in it about all kinds of things. Um, and it's a really cool model um, for having open LGBTQ focused content. So if you're interested in that, uh, please check that out. Aside from that. That's all for me. Thank you um, so much for, for joining this and for being here and for caring about this enough to show up to this work during a pandemic. I really appreciate it.